Also, because this is the 25th anniversary of the college, I, I should give you a little history of the college. And when I came here uh, to start teaching, fresh out of school, uh, I suggested uh, Craig Kuhner, a, a classmate of mine, would be a wonderful person to come and teach also. And he did come and teach here for a while. And when he was teaching here, he told me about uh, the time that he spent in Vienna at the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. And, how he knew Ernst Bleem, and Ernst Bleem at the time was studying with him there, but then went on to Columbia for a master's degree. He said Ernst would be wonderful to come teach here, and he was. And unfortunately, and we both know this is just the truth, the cold, hard truth, that Muncie wasn't beautiful enough to keep him here. But um, he happened to have tremendous talent, which he's uh, nurtured since then and has become even more talented and has done some wonderful work that I had a chance to see. And so uh, on this occasion of his 20th uh, anniversary at the College of Architecture, uh, to, to honor his return to Muncie, Craig Kuhner, who, who taught here and who was responsible for Ernst coming here, flew in from uh, Texas just to be here. And his student, uh, John Wurtz, who uh, was here 20 years ago, came down from South Bend with Gene. Where's John? Is John here? So we, it's great to see these people just because Ernst came back here after 20 years. So it's really a great personal pleasure to welcome Ernst back and, and to say that I hope you don't leave us uh, for such a long time next time you come back sooner. And on behalf of everybody here and all the polyarch groups, and I know there have been uh, summer travel groups, the Archiba group, and previous poly art groups, and my son and myself, and all the people and the students uh, who you've helped, um, we really are uh, in your debt for all the things you've done for our college and for this university, and we're delighted to have you back here. And we, um, I would give the title of your lecture, but I can't pronounce that word. And um, I leave the rest to you. We're very happy that you're here back with us. Uh, thank you, Marvin. It's really funny that uh, exactly 20 years ago, uh, almost at the same week, I was giving uh, my first lecture in my life at Ball State University. It was across the street in a dark, uh, nice room. Marvin, I think, uh, he asked me to substitute one of his lectures, and uh, I uh, gave a talk, or I was uh, reading something out of a manuscript. I was talking about vernacular architecture on Greek islands. And, uh, I was reading all this stuff and I showed a, a couple of slides and when I finished this thing, only when the lights turned on, only one girl was sitting in the lecture hall <laughs> and she came up to me and excused herself that my lecture took two hours and uh, Marvin's lecture was supposed to be only one hour and so everybody had to leave for another class. So. I really hope that this doesn't happen a second time uh, to me, that uh, you are the only one who waits for me until I am finished. I try to make it very fast. Uh, as fast as you ca uh, can uh, shrink or pull out 20 years. I would like to talk about 20 years of my profession not about uh, the other things which might be much more important to me, but about my job as an architect. Could you turn off this light, please, and uh, turn on the slides? When Ernst was coming here, he said there's an old saying in his country <laughs> that a criminal always likes to return to the scene of his first crime. This was 20 years ago when we came from New York or Craig from Philadelphia. Craig sits on the right side 
And on the left side is his son, Chris, who is in college now. This was the uh, School of Architecture. There was another guy I didn't mention, Pliny Fisk, uh, a very good friend of us. He was supposed to come, but he uh, uh, has to give a lecture some other place. We were living out on a, on a farm in a little hut, and I tried to rebuild this little farmhouse to have uh, some environment to stay and work in. We did everything by ourselves with just cardboard and plywood and paint. It was a, this kind of living environment without movable furniture. Uh, only the TV was movable and the yellow and white thing on the right side I found on a junkyard just to furnish uh, the place in Munsey. I was uh, doing a little uh, a house addition in Munsey also 20 years ago. I haven't seen it uh, yet, but I think it still stands up. One professor from Ball State University asked me to uh, give his house a new entryway. Most American houses uh, have a formal, right? Fine. They have, they had a formal entry, and uh, since everybody came by car, uh, the back door became the main entry. And so, I uh, tried to make an entry space between the carport and the house. Uh, after we got the costs, the client uh, said that we have to do it for the half price, and so we changed the design, this round uh, space, which was supposed to be enclosed by walls. Uh, we enclosed by, just by bushes and trees. And uh, I have to say one thing at this point. I built this with a student, with John Werns, who came from South Bend. We were working, I think, four or five or six weeks, and we did the whole thing. And it was a wonderful time. Craig Kuna, uh, our architectural photographer, took those pictures after I already left. Uh, Dr. Renke, our client, I, am f I feel very sad about his uh, dad. He had an accident a couple of years ago. There were some other things I took with me from Munsey. The competition they uh, wrote out for the architectural buildings, and those were some entries. Uh, a high-rise for this building, yeah. And uh, the right thing, uh, if I remember it right, was done by your dean, Bob Fisher. He had uh, the best idea probably uh, at the beginning for this school and not only for the uh, second phase. Anyhow, the faculty at this time was not very happy with the uh, solution of the jury. And I remember that they gave once a, a first year design um, task to use the structure from the architectural building as, as something to start with and build around the architectural buildings uh, student housings uh, so that there is a working and living environment in one thing. For some reason I had to leave uh, Munsey. I was not very unhappy about this. Uh, I was glad I had a job in uh, Houston, in Texas, and the first week I arrived there, my car got stuck in a hurricane and was overfloated. And it, 
almost all the slides I, I took from Mansi look like this. In Houston, I got a commission uh, to build a chapel in Santa Domingo in the Dominican Republic. I saw uh, this chapel uh, two years ago the, for the first time. I uh, drew all the drawings and built models and sent and shipped everything to, to Santa Domingo. Craig Kuna was there uh, 15 or 18 years ago. He took those pictures and sent them to me to Austria. I was teaching at the University of Houston and I was giving uh, to some students the task. Uh, now I'm getting mixed up. I have to go back. I was giving a church as a, a task and some contractor from Houston uh, who was sponsoring a Baptist uh, missionary church in Santa, in Santa Domingo. Uh, he wanted to build a church for them and he wanted to have some help designing them and he came up with, he brought this kind of chapel. I built this model afterwards just to compare it with mine with my design solution and I talked him out of this uh, central space and I talked him into uh, the design on the right side since this was a Baptist church and those uh, people uh, put a lot of emphasis in, in baptism I wanted to uh, express somehow uh, the roof and the rainwater and the, uh, collecting the water falling down from the uh, sky. I wanted to have the baptismal pool underneath the rain gutter of the building. So I also placed a reflecting pool in front of the chapel and the people who entered uh, the sacred area, I had to cross some steps across the pool, passing on the right side the baptismal uh, area with the gutter. All those were models and I always try to build uh, very exact models so they get as close as possible to reality because if you uh, build something you, if you have already built something, you never can change it. And uh, I made this, the model on the left side was already uh, finished when I got two years later, when the chapel was built, the picture uh, from the left side. And for some reason, uh, they almost look alike. Those are just examples. I, do, uh, I did the drawings and I built uh, the models with all the nuts and bolts for the uh, roof structure so there is no communication problem between the Spanish speaking uh, uh, workers and the Austrian, the German speaking architect. One day I got a slide uh, where I had this window uh, to the chapel where I saw a cross and some kind of strange solar blocks. So I called them up and said they, that they have to change it and they have to find some material which fits to my model. And they changed it and uh, put those solar blocks in it. Everything was done by the local people without uh, big mechanical equipment. This is a scene where a Texas priest is baptizing a girl in the pool. And there was one other thing I like to mention. I was studying at Columbia and they once brought out a sculpture competition at Columbia University. And I won this competition and it was supposed to be a 20 feet high aluminum piece like you see on the left side, Alcoa uh, wanted to build it. They sponsored it. 
And then when I spoke with, with those guys, they asked me to find a place where they could put uh, the name of Alcoa to the sculpture. It was 68, 69, and I was afraid since Alcoa was so much involved in the Vietnam War that the students at Columbia would tear down this sculpture, so I didn't let them build it at Columbia University. Uh, and then two years later, I uh, built it in front of this chapel. These were the model I was handing in. It was a theme of uh, yin and yang, of uh, emotional and intellectual. Uh, on the left side, you see it, uh, the sculpture has its point of gravity lower to the bottom if you walked around. Uh, the point of gravity moved upwards. And I positioned this sculpture on the way uh, going into the chapel. Uh, the picture doesn't show this really, but the point of gravity is a little bit lower. And when you come out the door from the chapel, uh, the sculpture, sculpture changed its gravity and its appearance. I really uh, am not pleased with the inside because I thought that the roof structure should be natural as I had built it in my model. But uh, those guys down there, they paint everything white to preserve uh, it from termites or, or moisture. On the right side is a, a picture Craig Kuhner took, and I think he won an Indiana Photography Award for this. And the left side I took two years ago when I was there, the first time there. So the whole thing changed and aged a little bit, and I hope it changed uh, with it aged with dignity. The only thing I really hate is uh, that they uh, made a little swimming pool out of uh, this area where the water came, comes down. So they, the people who are getting baptized don't have to get into the dirty pool. But I left Houston and I went back home to Hall in Tirol, my, the town I was born, and I inherited there uh, an old house and a landmark. And so I always was planning to, get, to go back home once. I mean, uh, leaving Munzi wasn't so bad as, as it sounded first. I, uh, the re I came back, and that's a sign that I somehow like this place, and especially the people. But I had a uh, plan to stay away, to study at Columbia, and to spend two or three years in the United States, and then go back. Hull is uh, close to Innsbruck, as you see it on the left side. Everybody knows Innsbruck because the Olympic Winter Games took place there twice. Hull is also the place where they minted coins in the 14th century, they minted coins with the, they call Thaler, and uh, without being chauvinistic, uh, uh, the history says that the Thaler was the forefather of the dollar. It was a currency used uh, all over the world, and this tower is our, as the Eiffel Tower in Paris, this coin tower is the sign of my hometown. It's a medieval town, and uh, it received its township 1300. And uh, it's one of the few towns in Austria who has a completely uh, undestroyed medieval city environment, put, uh, protected by uh, still visible walls. And just on, at the east of this town, I have this house which was uh, 
a recreation house for Jesuits, a monastery. You see the hall on the upper side of the right slide, and you see a view, a drawing from the outside. It was in a very bad shape when I came home because uh, an old house, you, you have to maintain a house and, and having not done to the house something for 50 or 100 years, it would have of fallen apart if I wouldn't have reconstructed it. Yeah, this is the situation of the house. Maybe uh, a quarter of the mile outside the city. It's a very amazing kind of structure and it, it's probably, uh, it, it was designed by a very good architect because all the proportions of the house are incredibly interesting. Everything uh, was done according to the golden section and before I started rebuilding it, uh, I made a, an, I analyzed the whole structure and I found out that everything was just wonderful uh, in order. My wife, who is an architect too, she did this study and this is the ground plan and uh, I think Mies van der Rohe uh, wouldn't have done it better maybe a little bit worse, but you see the, I feel like a, a, a chain dog, a dog on a chain. Okay. This is uh, south and north and uh, it has 12 meters by 24 meters, approximately. And this is a big refectorium, uh, a space where the Jesuits were eating. And this is a big stair hall with these symmetrical stairways going up. And during the last centuries, uh, they changed all kinds of rooms in here. They put the toilets. And uh, this is the north side, the north elevation after uh, the renovation. So everything is finished by this time. But I am going to tell you the story uh, how I rebuilt this house and uh, how I restored the house, which took me uh, 12 years, almost half of the time, more than half of the time I, uh, of the 20 years I was talking. The house has three uh, floors, one ground floor, not to speak about the basement, and one uh, attic. Uh, one uh, like a uh, byzantine uh, added uh, roof structure. And uh, as the ground plan has this regular module, also the section is in a very uh, nice proportional order. The house had, uh, uh, for some reason they built uh, new chimneys. This was the old chimney. I'm really shaking, am I? Uh, and I took out those old chimneys and I put them in the geometric point where they're supposed to belong. I found out that they, the chimneys were there before and they had to, they were changed for some reason. This was the time when I came back home in the uh, early 70s, I uh, have a poster from this exhibition in Munsey, I think. And this was my first uh, working place in the house in this area. I, the round window here is, is over there. And I put the bathroom in there. The other drawings show the different kind of kitchens we had in the last 12 years in the house. We had about four uh, kitchens, it always had to, the kitchens always re, were moved according uh, to the stage of our uh, reconstruction. This was the bathroom, Craig Kuna took the pictures, and I, 
I realized that I built this bathroom just for four years. Then I changed my plans and I had to take out, to take everything out again. So you see, it's a, a reconstruction uh, going backwards in a way. And the right size, the yellow things uh, show all the uh, structural parts I took out. Those yellow things show the chimneys which weren't put in, in the geometric uh, exact point. The black dots are the new chimneys. Here you see it in section. I brought in the new chimneys and took out the old ones. And I found out that uh, this wall is exactly the geometric point from the, from the roof. And when we built the roof, uh, I found out that the lower roof around here has exactly the same size than the upper roof. Um, on, on half, uh, uh, as close as one square foot. I'm going to explain the different stages uh, it took me four stages to rebuild the house. We start uh, at, the, at the top. For some reason, I, I, I started at the top. Most houses are going to be started at the foundations. But I started with the chimneys. And the chimneys brought me down all the way to the basement afterwards. Those are the things with the roof and those chimneys they put in there. And while I was taking the roof of the house, I saw all kinds of new light uh, experiences in, in the house. So I changed my mind and I uh, built uh, skylights. This was the space before uh, the rebuilding and on the left side you see the space after the rebuilding where the light comes through the roof and goes all the way through this stairway to the ground floor and this is a nice experience because it changes uh, while the sun is rising. Here there are different phases. The brown thing always says the construction site uh, during the first phase, the, almost half the house was under construction. I, was, uh, I had a, a living area here and an office area there. The second phase, I, I moved with the office in the large refectorium and I was rebuilding this part and we were living in here. And the third phase, I was uh, uh, rebuilding the refectorium with, our, with the bath where we were living before and the upper bath and we moved up into the third floor and uh, the fourth I forgot uh, what this was but I think it just shows this is my office space right now and this is our living space and the yellow thing uh, was supposed to be our a guest room uh, space, but since uh, we have more kids than we have planned, uh, they already moved up there. So this is the different lightning, um, natural light thing, which uh, uh, changes the space. The more um, the, the sun hits only the white wall, uh, this space underneath is, is very light and the more it hits the stair with the red uh, carpet, the space uh, changes its color. This was the stair hall before I started reconstructing uh, it and restoring it. You see this entry. Uh, this is a bad example, but we had to take off all this marble paint. I hate to tell you, Art Shaler, uh, that 
that uh, we take marble off the wood <laughs> and to, to have it natural, but probably it wasn't uh, uh, such a nice job you do. There you see uh, it take, how it was taken off. There's a certain kind of quality of this uh, railing of the stair. I really hated it when I was a young boy because I had to clean it all the time. And it took me a long time with a piece of cloth uh, cleaning all these, these holes from dust. But then once I, I made uh, Christmas cards and I took a photograph and I found out that, that there was such a beautiful uh, motion in this jigsaw work. Uh, it, it was a, uh, an expression of moving upward. If you look at these ornaments, they constantly uh, uh, move upwards and it, it has a nice beginning and a, a nice end and everything is very elegant. There's a nice comparison uh, about this uh, movement. You could do it with grace or you just cut, you just could fall like a, a sack. <laughs> but anyhow, this are the two different times. We had a, times in, a time in Austria or in, in art history when they every uh, thing painted in marble because they weren't uh, able to afford marble. Nowadays, it's uh, the opposite around. Uh, it's marble became so cheap that uh, maybe painting, uh, marbling everything is in again. By the way, this is the back entry of my office. And this was uh, during the construction site when uh, we had uh, close the doors to the other room just with a piece of, of plywood. And at this time, I was doing a fire department building in Hull. And those are New York uh, uh, fire chief heads. And we had to take a picture for the fire, for the opening. And so I borrowed those heads. This is this building uh, outside of the town of Hull. Uh, the old medieval town wall is just up here somewhere. Uh, the people who stayed in Hull from Paul State, they lived in this uh, hotel tower. They might recognize this. Uh, this title of my lecture, Autochtonous Architecture, uh, I don't know. It isn't really true that I am going to talk about uh, autochthonous architecture. We are doing an exhibition about the Rolian architecture in, in New York next year. And uh, Kenneth Frampton had the idea, since he saw some uh, stuff we do, that autochthonous would be the right word for this, for this uh, thing. This project is the only project included in this show. And uh, I had to look it up by myself in Webster Dictionary what autochthonous means. And it means something uh, indigenous or grown only and on a certain spot. Or I, I forgot everything else. But it's a fire department building uh, with all the... Uh, garages for the cars in the first floor and social rooms for the firemen on the second and uh, public housing or housing uh, apartments for the city employees on the, on the third floor. This very uh, uh, vertical kind of thing is the hose drying tower. Again, uh, building the model very carefully. Uh, I was very sad that 
this is some kind of a lowering uh, sun protection. They never, uh, they refused to make this. And I really would have liked to have this thing coming down because this elevation was somehow a play for me between vertical elements and uh, horizontal elements. This is the plan and the section. There was a trick uh, uh, using these 45 degree uh, garages. They, they wanted first to have that every truck has a, a, a separate door so they could fast uh, leave the garage, but then I told them they, they couldn't drive on the road uh, in a row of five cars. So I, for, uh, I brought them into thinking that they could also stand behind each other, and, it, and this changed the elevation. Uh, it was somehow, it, it break down the monotony of, of straight garage doors. I also digged it in a little bit uh, so the building doesn't get too high. And I was again playing with water as in the chapel in Santa Domingo. I thought that fire, that water is the element uh, firemen use to fight against the water. And I was afraid that they put some strange piece of art on the building. So I used the, the, the budget for the art uh, to collect the water from the roof uh, and put it into a, a little pool. And the roof gutter had an electric pump and water was uh, raining out there uh, every day, even if it was not raining. But then People in the neighborhood, they were afraid that kids could fall in this little pool, so they drained uh, the water. This stairway on the uh, right side leads up on top of the garage, where there is the entry to the uh, private apartments. Those are the skylights uh, over the garage. This was the first scheme uh, of the fire department and uh, I changed the design and I thought that I might burn it. Uh, but back to my house, I'm telling this story in a, a chronological way uh, so I don't get uh, messed up. Uh, and I only uh, tried to show you the things somehow I liked, I did uh, many other things I built, uh, I don't show. But uh, now I am in the second phase of the construction. Uh, this was my uh, small office in between. This was a, a little space in this area. And I took all the yellow walls out and you will see at the end how this office space looks like. This was our fir first kitchen. Uh, I had just uh, finished two or three years ago and then we took it out. And the area of the house in this phase uh, is this area. I took out this ceiling and instead of have, having two uh, uh, floors, I changed it into three floors. I had to take care of this load from the upper story and I put eye beams in there with braces. As you see, those are the old beams, the old wooden beams. I took out. It looks kind of strange uh, when you see from the basement all the way to the attic.
And this was the entry, the old entry of the house. And this is the stage where the second or the first ceiling uh, to pour the concrete for the first ceiling. The, the second ceiling is already poured. And here you see the whole history of uh, elevation of a house, how it's changed. This was the original, or this was the uh, elevation, west elevation, as I changed. When I was a boy with about um, 15, uh, we had a window up there, and uh, it was just a window in a corridor of the house, and, and my mother uh, told me to close it, so I closed it, so she uh, had one window less to clean. And then I opened it up again uh, because I thought that this elevation as time changed it just wasn't uh, good enough for the scheme of the house. I had to do all kinds of uh, schemes in order to get it approved by the landmark committee. Uh, it could have been possible that it was like this. Uh, I wanted to express our uh, or my time uh, uh, this is the site, uh, the street level, and this is the uh, level where you enter. And for some reason, I wanted to have this motion going down, expressed in the elevation on the uh, on the elevation. But the landmark uh, committee they just smiled about this. Then we made a compromise, as we always make, have to make. Uh, and that's the way how it turned out to be. So I, the only thing I uh, changed was I just put a little window in this part of the elevation. I used the stone uh, of the old uh, entry, a uh, piece of marble on the new one. This is a close-up. <laughs> and those are the new office spaces in the on the first floor uh, of the second uh, construction phase. Since I was not allowed to change anything on the outside, on the street elevation, uh, the landmark uh, people somehow, the elevation you saw before, nobody sees from the street. So they don't really bother you too much uh, if, if uh, nobody sees it. But uh, the street elevation was a very, uh, they were very much concerned about this. So I had to put this ceiling of the first floor. I couldn't touch the outside wall uh, because I would uh, uh, change uh, the window. So I just hang it, hang the whole, hang the whole thing from wall to wall without touching uh, the walls outside. And there's some kind of a, a nice relation relationship between the upper level of the office and the lower level of the office. The yellow thing is again all the structure I took out. This is the plan from the upper level in the office. We have four tables there and a stairway, a circular stairway is leading up to On the left side is the elevation as it was, and I found out that the three big windows in the first floor, they were uh, built, uh, they were not original, and so I changed it, and I 
made only small uh, windows. I had a hard time with the with the landmark committee because uh, the church on the right side, this church belonged to the Jesuits, the former owner of our house, and um, they wanted me to paint it red and yellow, my house, and uh, I, I never would have liked to do it. Uh, it would have liked as Charles Moore probably would have done it. And so I wanted to have it uh, white and gray, and I was talking with them, and they approved it, and then uh, the painter already started, and then the guys came and said I was completely wrong. I w was planning to uh, paint the, the flat surface uh, gray and around the window and this mullions uh, between the elevation and the roof. I wanted to paint this white. But they said that that's not the right thing to do. This uh, gray thing they imitate stone, or they are supposed to imitate stone, and so I have to paint it gray, paint it gray. Uh, I had to do them because most of my uh, involvement, my financial involvement uh, was tax deductible as long as the landmark committee approves it, and so they, they really forced me to do it. At the same time, I did the house in the city of Hull, where they allowed it uh, me uh, completely the different way, the way I wanted to have it, around the window white and the elevation gray, because it increases the light coming through the window. So, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, I won a competition to do a church in my outside uh, my hometown on a new housing complex. It's a, a Catholic church. And this was taken by, a, by somebody uh, just that the day the church was open because this is only decoration. And the church uh, consists of a sacred religious space and an apartment for the priest and his housekeeper. Those pictures, uh, Craig Kuhner took last year when he was in Austria. This is, uh, the left side is the uh, south side. The, the church is on the upper floor because the, the land has a, a, a slight slope and you could enter the church from the north side from the sidewalk and from the south side you walk up a couple of steps. Uh, it was incredible. Uh, last June, they put the bells in this tower, and the bells, when they f first rang the bells, the tower was moving about one foot. <laughs> and I called up the structural engineer, and, and I told him, that I, I asked him already when it wasn't finished, because I was cl once climbing up and I was able to move the tower with my hand. And he said, oh, it doesn't matter, concrete is very weak, or like a rubber, if you reinforce it, it the right way. I wanted uh, to have a very low kind of church, so it fits, it doesn't, uh, fight with the high-rise apartment buildings around. I wanted to have um, somehow a transition between the high-rise, uh, the church, and the neighboring uh, uh, two-story high residence, residences. That's the uh, interior. And I always have to look at my models because they uh, come very close to the reality. The right side is a, a model picture, and the left side is a slight Craig Kuhner duck, I think. The church is uh, a Saint Francis Francesco church, and this is the reason why I choose the 
material, wood and brick. I wanted to have a very simple kind of material like in Assisi, uh, all churches are. But I tell you that uh, this brick wall was more expensive than a marble wall because we don't have any brick layers anymore. I also wanted to have a completely difference between the exterior and the interior, outside very sharp and white, and even with, with 45 degree corners and inside everything square and warm and uh, with bricks. We did a lot of studies um, on the lightning in the model and we measured the light coming in and this uh, over this, uh, how do you call this? Light coming from above, uh, skylight. <laughs> Uh, I found out uh, during the model building stage that too much light coming into from this area and, and uh, then we corrected it and we made some wooden um, louvers there. Yeah, those were the tricks, how we checked it, the model and the roof structure. And this model was only about uh, one and a half feet by one and a half feet. Between the Parsons house and the church, there is the sanctuary with all the preparation rooms. There's a little chapel uh, underneath the sanctuary. And this window uh, serves two rooms, one for the priests and one for the boys and girls. And this is just a, a fake up, that's a mirror. So, uh, a room would really look strange if there is a window just at the corner. Uh, below the church, the main room, there is a social uh, space for the neighborhood where they could gather together and have parties. There's a public small library. And this is the chapel I mentioned before. This is the first set of carousels. I think I'm going to make it in one hour. <laughs> I'm back to my house and ready for the third construction phase, which was the most complicated one. And this is the plan of the uh, second floor. Uh, this part belongs to the office. This is the stair hall, the stairway. Uh, this space was my first little office space after I came back from uh, the United States. And up there, I took out every wall. I had to take out every wall because all those, uh, they were wood uh, walls with stone uh, uh, infill. And the whole structure uh, was hanging about a foot. This ceiling uh, over my big office, over the refectorium, was hanging, uh, as I said, one foot, because it got the load uh, from the chimneys they had built in there. This is a chimney. Uh, 20, 30 feet high, standing on, uh, sitting on wooden beams. So I, I took out all those uh, load-carrying walls, this one and this one, and I put steel beams up there to hold up the upper story. Uh, the ceiling over the refectorium had, was, a, was hang up on a, a bridge structure and when they built in this wrong chimney, they cut a couple of uh, uh, load-bearing members and the ceiling was bending like this. This is a section in the other direction. The chimney was sitting on, 
on this. So I took out this wall and I took out this wall and uh, uh, introduced a complete new load-bearing system out of steel and concrete. But before I found out about all those things, I had to find the structural members. We uh, got, we took off the, the plaster, then we found the wood and this uh, stone walls and as soon as we took them out, we only had the structure. And it was quite complicated because the ceiling in the office, in the refectorium, was a landmark as well, um, Renaissance type of wooden ceiling. And I had to support this ceiling with, uh, so I, I, I didn't destroy all those mullions. And I had only the sea, I, only the ceiling was left, everything else, the wooden beams up there, I had to take out. I had about 500 stamps in the house in this part. All, this is the office. And it all uh, went down all the way to the basement. And uh, in this forest of, of, of uh, columns, we had to bring in the steel beams, which was quite difficult. They are very heavy. There you see this bridge structure. And we had little, very uh, uh, little doors. Uh, everybody had to bend his head because of the, just because of the structure. And there you see where it was cut apart and where the whole thing was pushed down. So a crane lifts it in, and here we have already lifted it up, and here we are already clearing out the forest of, of columns. And that's the way we did it. Uh, some walls we exchanged uh, to, uh, into concrete walls. And this is the steel structure. And uh, this is a, a suspension who pulls uh, the load up. I was thinking I, I wouldn't like to have too much concrete in my house. And, and uh, I wouldn't need to pour everything in concrete. So since these spaces were the children's rooms, I thought I'd make big holes in the wall so they could communicate. I tell you, uh, that's, this was the first time I had, the first thing I had to do when they moved in to close those hall, holes because they, everybody uh, wanted to have their own privacy and that's understandable. So you see, those are the beams I had to take out, and they uh, were rotten like this at the exterior wall. Because, as I said, the house was built as a recreation house, only used in the summertime. And since 150 years, uh, it was used also in the wintertime. And people were cooking in the house and heating it, uh, creating a lot of moisture and humidity. And since the walls weren't uh, insulated well enough, uh, the air uh, 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 became water on the outside uh, of the wall. How do you call this when a thing like this happens? Condensation. Condensation, that's right. Yeah, here, all the beams are cut all the load-bearing beams from the ceiling were moved out. And uh, uh, this is the upper part of the Renaissance ceiling. I cleaned everything with a vacuum cleaner. And then we started uh, the new uh, ceiling. This is a prefabricated uh, steel concrete uh, beam with concrete walls, and the green thing is uh, poured concrete. 
And I had to hang up the Renaissance ceiling with this metal thing. You see the insulation. You, you, you use pink insulation, I saw the other day in Vermont. We use yellow one. <laughs> but anyhow, this is the new ceiling. It's a prefabricated thing you could buy, and you could just uh, put in place very easily. And the next day, we poured the concrete. We were always living in this house, not to speak about uh, uh, the babies and uh, the pregnancies of my wife uh, uh, at this time when all this noise happened. So we are a little bit closer to the fourth stage. Everything is already sheetrocked. I wanted to uh, use a wood burning stove because I got so many uh, wood out of the house that I uh, am able to heat it for the next uh, 30 years. And it took me quite some time to find a place for this stove. And I built a one-to-one -one styrofoam model and moved it around. And after I decided uh, on the shape, on the form, this is the wood burning stove. And this part is uh, um, also a tile stove, but it has electric wires in there. So I could heat everything uh, electrically as well. Those were the tiles for the stove. And we did our footprints. The whole family uh, left their footprints on the tiles, which walk over the stove. And here are those guys who, who built, built it up. It, it took them a week to do it. And they really did a, quite a good job. Those kind of stoves, they are uh, used very often in the Alps. Uh, the farmers used it as well as uh, kings and queens, just in different shapes, simple ones and more sophisticated ones. I don't have very good slides from my uh, oven. The company who made it uh, made some commercials. And they, uh, I took pictures from their uh, pictures. This part of the house, uh, we don't heat. And in the wintertime, we had to put the butter in the refrigerator to keep it uh, soft enough uh, so we could smear it. I used some part of the old wood. Uh, this is about 400 year old wood, and it has a very narrow, how do you call those lines in the wood? Rings, yeah. Uh, it, the rings, there were about 150 rings from, from the center to the outside, which means that this wood was already 150 years old when it was uh, cut the first time 300 years ago. I'm not going to burn uh, this kind of wood. So uh, our apartment is finished, and that's the plan how we uh, live. Uh, I wanted to have some kind of a dimension in the house. I wanted to uh, see from one end to the other. Uh, and this is uh, the view where you could look through. This idea uh, is not too good because someone needs privacy. And uh, visual things and uh, psychological th things are uh, something completely different. I had a door in here, and the door uh, you saw first was a glass door only, 
and my uh, wife refused to sit in this area because everybody who came into our uh, apartment uh, just just ran into there was no transitional space then I closed this door I just couldn't stop rebuilding the house I guess and I opened the door here and then I found out that it was much much better to have one axis in this direction and one axis in this direction and I had uh, for some reason I had planned it anyhow before this is the living room and the structure I painted yellow and in between the structure I put some mirrors so uh, it, everything uh, is a little bit lighter you don't see the load uh, which is carried I also took out I cut off out this beam here it was rotten and so there are other beams uh, structural beams still in there I covered with with sheetrock I had a hard time uh, I did my planning all the time on the site I didn't do it uh, in my office and so I had a, comp a real difficulty with this point where the structural rods had to go through the partition wall between the corridor on one side and the living room on the other side but since I, I, I made most of those things uh, by myself I'm not playing tennis and I'm not playing basketball so uh, I have to have some kind of a physical effort uh, to stay healthy This was, uh, this is my wife, by the way. Uh, I had put a drawing table as our dining table. We changed this. I built these lamps out of uh, skylights. I was experimenting uh, with lamps. I'm still experimenting with lamps because I'm supposed to put another lamp over our. Uh, dining table yeah here you see I already had those holes um, put into the walls in this direction because I thought that uh, somehow there should be um, another axis in the house and after I, I had find the position for the uh, oven I wanted to have this axis expressed and it took me quite some time and a couple of rebuilding things again this is the new door and since it was built in later I had to solve a problem. The floor on the outside was a little bit uh, lower than the floor on the inside. And so I uh, made it with a piece of marble, this step between inside and outside. There is a little slope going up. And I did this by myself and I really had a lot of fun because I used uh, all the marble samples I had in my office small little pieces this is an Ar Argentinian onyx uh, just maybe two inch by two inch and the joint between the, the plastered wall and the wood I put, I put a, a piece of plexiglass in there so you have some kind of the illusion that the door is, is just standing uh, and you have windows uh, left and right with a half an inch width
I have to show you this picture because uh, our jailer made us once a, a beautiful cake we have in our kitchen. Oh, this was another story. My wife wanted to uh, bake bread by herself. She, nev she never did, but she, she got the stove to do it. <laughs> and this is the living room, and, and um, in front of this wall, uh, this stove is, was put. And I, I was working on this marble on these pieces, those, those were leftovers from another building I did, uh, about three weeks to find a solution, how I should use it. And it's quite a funny thing, because you play with these ornaments, uh, like with a wooden veneer. If you have a chance uh, to, to use the natural uh, pattern of the thing, you, you really should do it. And after I had cut the marble and uh, after I had polished it on the other side so I could get mirror images, this guy, he put it wrong in there. Uh, you see, this one, uh, this uh, piece uh, was just upside down and I almost uh, took it out. Those were the pieces I, I found at, at my uh, project and you could uh, either make a design like this if you turn this around and uh, polish it on the other side and then I, I could have a, a Austrian Alpine uh, mountain scenery what I didn't want but uh, since this was a wood burning uh, uh, bread baking oven with fire and smoke I tried to uh, make us uh, some kind of a symbolistic uh, smoke design. It, it was fun. Uh, this was the building I was doing at this time, and you see the same marble on the floor. I, uh, I didn't steal those things. They, <laughs> they really were left over. It was a community uh, hall for a village, a Tyrolean village, as you see, with brass band and everything. A, a multifunctional uh, hall. On the right side is the stairway leading up from the foyer to the ballroom. It's a very simple building. And this was the existing site and there is the church and the community center and the a guest house and the post office and the farmer and those uh, buildings uh, with the new one i put it uh, in a in a way onto this side so it, it creates a public space it's very very simple but people they they like it I am back uh, to the house again. I, I hope uh, I have only two American flags, one in my office and one I had in my bathroom. My wife took them away from me because she thinks that I am too crazy about America. So uh, anyhow, this was, uh, this is exactly the same uh, spot. Uh, before the construction and after the construction, you see the roof from the neighbor ring building outside. This was the main corridor where I put a bathroom at the end. And I was, I was playing there with marble as well. If you remember the braces, there were braces uh, in here holding up the I-beams up there. And I was looking for two years, I was uh, looking for a piece of marble which uh, would uh, have a pattern which would follow uh, the brace uh, 
inside. But since Innsbruck is not too far away from Verona, it, it's, it's a two hours drive, and you could go to the quarry, stone quarries, you find everything what you want. Here, here is uh, this axis in the living room. This is the oven, and I made, on the other side of this uh, closet, there is the wood-burning uh, kitchen stove. I wanted to have a mirrored kind of uh, thing in the furniture. Those two things go together. I am not very happy about this anymore, but I had a cabinet maker, a very unpractical cabinet maker, a very talented guy, but uh, he, he just always did what he wanted to do. And so it turned out to be somehow a, a postmodern kind of thing. I took away this uh, top already. It was on the stove. Here is a leftover from the bathroom, Marvel. But the nice thing with this closet was that uh, I was able to choose uh, the piece of wood, uh, the big board, and uh, I told him, you make the doors out of uh, this uh, kind of wood and, and the drawers out of this wood. And I wanted to have one plastic uh, laminated uh, little uh, drawers and he doesn't use plastics so he only uh, uses paint and paint and since my my wife she always bothered me uh, during the whole construction site she never had drawers where she could put something in uh, so i made so many furnitures now she has 200 drawers and they are empty Oh yeah, that, that's something else. I, uh, after the, the wood, our stove was finished, I was not very unhappy for some reason. This was the way how it was built. And I've, I found out that I, it would have been much, much better if it would have been like this. So this, uh, it always seems to me that uh, those two things fall apart because uh, Nothing closes them on the top. And next time I do it other, different. Yeah, this cabinet maker, he came up with this. Uh, those were also uh, little doors you just could uh, turn around. And I took them out and changed them into some um, less aggressive uh, things. It's only a, a, a place where you could put some nice glasses, where you put silverware and where you put uh, uh, whiskey bottles and all those other things. But he did a very, very uh, nice job And he doesn't even use a, a, a paint. A, what is a paint without any color coating? Yeah. A clear paint. Yeah, he 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 doesn't um, put anything on the wood. It has to stay natural because he thinks that the wood um, gets nicer when when it isn't preserved. Yeah, those were the, he, he didn't do me all those little wooden strips so we could put the silver uh, in it, so I had to cut it by myself, measuring out knives and forks. So, you see I took uh, the top off and it looks much nicer now. Oh, we finally also got a, nice, a new table. 
uh, Italian one, a convertible table, you could uh, make it larger and bigger. It's a, it's a mess. Uh, yeah, we got also a seating group, and since we have a very democratic family, uh, everybody choose their own color. The lamp uh, once fell down and broke. <laughs> but this painting, uh, a friend of mine did, uh, it's, the title from this painting is uh, Slowly uh, Parts Are Falling Very Slowly. And, and I wanted to use the parts from the lamp to make some kind of a mobile, but my wife threw it in the garbage. So, my son, Bernhard, I think that's all. Uh, no? <laughs> yeah, th this, this was the fourth uh, and the last thing. I took off the paint in my office, the brown thing, and I found out that in earlier times it was painted blue. And now it's white. <laughs> uh, yeah, back in the office, I show you maybe two or three other uh, projects very fast. This is a housing uh, complex I did in Innsbruck for uh, uh, 75 apartments. And I wanted to since it's, it is a social housing and housing with very limited budget, I wanted to play uh, with the circulation, uh, how, do, how people go to their apartment, and I wanted to express this uh, on the outside. I didn't want to use stairs uh, going from the first floor all the way to the top floor, so I, I had a circulation system where people meet and where people uh, separate again before they uh, go in their apartment. And this is this site. It's very difficult to take pictures from, as Craig Cotelio, who took this. This is the north side, and the slope from the hill goes up right away. And This is the south. Oh, yeah. We once entered uh, the competition to build a new bridge for Innsbruck. Innsbruck. And uh, we won uh, one of three prizes from 40 entries, but then they decided to build the bridge in concrete. There was a big pressure, a big power from the concrete people and the steel people just were not uh, good enough, not strong enough. Oh, uh, since I'm teaching at the University of Innsbruck, I, I, I should show you some projects we did with students. In Hull, we always use uh, sites uh, where we have a strong context. This house, some of uh, you who have been in Hull, I showed them, I showed you the house and we were inside. They restored the, uh, this house which was, which is maybe 50 or 80 years old and they were thinking that this is a, an old house. I gave it to the student as a design problem, making something new in the city, because I think that the city, that every time has to add something uh, to its environment. Maybe we made so many things wrong that nobody trusts us anymore, but um, 
the richness of our uh, medieval down is only is the result of uh, a creative process that every time has added something. We have something Baroque, we have Gothic, we have Renaissance, we have uh, Rococo, and now we, we, we have nothing anymore. We have to uh, play, uh, we have to restore uh, theater scenery. This is some, some other building in, in, in Vorarlberg, in, in another uh, state close. And a building burned down, and we thought that we are going to take out this building and build a new um, structure down there. And this student, this is a castle, and he put as a uh, some kind of a dialogue between the old and the new one, he put a glass tower into the city, which is a very nice project. Or another one. I mean, I know that we are very rich in having beautiful sites. So this is the last, the last uh, uh, building phase. We took out a couple of trees in our garden. After Chernobyl hap happened, we, our kids couldn't walk out uh, for a week. And I always wanted to have a swimming pool. So we took away a couple of trees, and uh, my wife uh, likes to collect hippo, hippo the, how do you call those animals in, swimming in, in the River Nile? No. <laughs> hippo. Yeah, she collects hippopotamuses. And, <laughs> and I, 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 I was talking her into the, the, into the landscape design, because I, I made the, fa the head of a hippopotamus, as you recognize here. <laughs> uh, there's one space I didn't talk about in our house. This is a, a big, huge glass veranda. And uh, it's a very nice space. And uh, if we wouldn't have this uh, veranda here, we couldn't use the garden because uh, there's a constant east wind, uh, which starts at exactly every day at 12 o'clock. And this is also a, a, a very funny uh, proportion space. It's about 24 meters long, and the, this side is one meter wider than this side. And since the whole thing is a a, a wooden structure. It is very. It was very complicated uh, to make those two walls not parallel because all those wooden panels have a different size, a different shape, and I think that they did it for a spatial reason. Uh, the Renaissance people knew how to manipulate uh, spaces by making them. Uh, um, out of uh, two parallel walls. Yeah, I, we had to take off all the paint from this wooden structure. And this was taken when it wasn't furnished. And so I think that's the end of uh, my show. Uh, I just want to, oh no. Oh, that's the last thing. That's a competition I won uh, a month ago. And it's an elementary school uh, with four classrooms and some other things in a village with two existing buildings where I had such this, such a, uh, uh, where I pulled a structure, where I built a structure to create an outdoor space in this village. And this is the uh, entry hall. And we try to use passive solar energy. Uh, the entry hall has uh, 20 feet high glass walls. And since I talked the people into that this was very economically, they, 
they let us build this without uh, building it in a Tyrolean style. This is the entry hall with, with steps where you could sit on. So I have, uh, I have to, everybody has to make a statement at the end, I think, uh, or I feel it. Uh, architecture uh, as a job, or is it a business? And I think that architecture uh, is something in between. If you think about uh, a baker, I need a little bit once more. He already took one carousel away. Did you? Sorry. Just go to the end. No, uh, you're wrong. Okay. No, that, this was right. Uh, a baker is a real form giver. Uh, he makes the most beautiful things out of uh, just bread and flour and some ingredients, and we need this for our daily life. And just think about the thousand difference of breads uh, all over the world. And on the other side, uh, a butcher is a guy who destroys form. And he makes pieces out of a, a form and shape. Just think about a hamburger. But I think architecture has to be something in between. And it's uh, some Japanese uh, told me uh, that in Japan they have a word hashi and they uh, use it for these chopsticks uh, to eat and they use it for uh, a bridge and they use it for a porch for, uh, in front of the house. They use it for a ladder where you walk from one uh, level to another. Um, and I think architecture is something in between. It's something which connects things. Uh, uh, like a joint uh, between two different things. Between intellect and emotion, inside and outside. Uh, between structural things and infill, uh, it, uh, you could use this word in between or those connections for everything in architecture. Uh, for psychological things, for uh, social things. And I think uh, we have to do a good job connecting things. And this is our main responsibility. And this really, uh, an architect, I shouldn't say a butcher or a baker, uh, an, archi an architect is in between. He is in between with lots of more responsibilities. And I hope you all carry those responsibilities when you are working uh, for your life. Thank you.